First and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the extraordinary pioneering work of a uh, young little girl uh, called Irene Fermont, who had a dream, and her dream came true. And uh, I join uh, Dr. Hirschman and many others in acknowledging the extraordinary persistence over overcoming all obstacles, and exactly you did. Vexter's Bioforum team support was essential, and I uh, thank all the speakers uh, coming from all over the world, uh, providing their expertise. I'd like also to, if it's possible, thank you, to acknowledge the presence in the room of Aviva Milgalter, since I'll be speaking about whistleblowers, well, uh, her belated, beloved husband, Zichonol Vracha, Eli Milgalter, was most definitely one of the foremost physician whistleblower in Israel. And uh, it's pretty rare, if not unique, I don't know of any other case like that in the world, where a widow takes over the torch, like in the Olympics, and uh, make sure the torch gets to the end point. Uh, and thank you very much to Professor Corin to have introduced various subjects of anxiety that can cause what we call in general terms the code of silence. The code of silence sounds more like the cosa nostra. And it is sometimes the cosa nostra. It's one of the aspects of Code of Silence. But if you'll allow me, I will start like in good old stories. Once upon a time, which way do I direct this? Once upon a time, there was a No, I have to cut From the keyboard. No, it's me who needs to cut it. Can you cut it? No, 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 no. Is it for keyboard? That's it. Thank All right. Now that we overcame the technical problems, well, you already know my name, so we can go over. As I said, once upon a time, I was Hans Brinker. For those of you who do not know Hans Brinker, believe it or not, it's a young Dutch boy in a story that was actually written by Mary Mapes Dodge in the United States, based on aspects that are true in Holland. And Hans Brinker, actually, as you can see here on the picture, is putting a finger in the hole of the dike alerting basically and protecting Holland from uh, basically a flood. But now that I'm a little less naive than Hans Sprinkler at the time, and by the way, for those of you who don't know the story, at the end, Hans Sprinkler turns out to choose medicine as a career. <laughs> now that I've learned and I've not been, I used to be once upon a time part of the silent majority. I come from a family, my father was an attorney, brilliant businessman on an international level. We have engineers and academicians in the family, but I'm the first physician. So I went into medicine for the ideal. And once upon a time, June 13, 2000, I received a phone call from an attorney I never met in my life. She never met me, we never spoke before. She found my name in the Los Angeles County Bar Association of Experts. She asked me what I thought was the most stupid question I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Dr. Melikovsky, do you believe it is within a normal practice, usual and customary, to remove a fellow boat fallopian tubes from a patient without her consent? Well, I don't think you need to be a foremost expert in obstetrics gynecology like myself to have the answer. May I have a few arms up or down telling me if you would believe, you ladies in particular, would you feel uh, perfectly happy to learn that both of you fallopian tubes were removed without your consent? Excuse me, no reaction? 
Well, raise your hands. Thank you. Two hands. Everybody else? So everybody else who doesn't raise their hands have no problem with a physician removing the both fallopian tubes. Well, I honestly thought this attorney was smoking something. <laughs> and I had a great opinion about the ability of the creativity and imagination of attorneys in California and Los Angeles in particular. So I asked her, where's your case? Is it in South America, Africa, or India? No, no, no. She says it's in the United States. Oh, Texas. I trained at Baylor College in Houston, so we've seen a few original things, and patients are a little radical as well. It is perfectly acceptable in Texas for a young woman, 26 years old, with two kids, to have a hysterectomy as a contraceptive method. So no, she says it's not Texas. It's California. Oh, Bakersfield, you know, some hole in the wall. She says, no, 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 Tarzana Hospital. No, so happens that I was at Tarzana Hospital by that time 14 years. Not only was I at the top of the pyramid of my department, but I was mandatorily part of and active on the peer and chart review committee, which is the committee oversight for complications. Now, this case supposedly happened three years before, Never heard about it. So it didn't happen in my department. So I asked her, was it a general surgeon's case? Was it a peritonitis, an infection in the abdomen, a cancer, and the pathologist found the, the tubes? No, she said. It was a pregnancy in the tube following a test tube baby procedure. Now, I suspect she got everything wrong because we're only four or five physicians in the test tube baby program. I never heard about it. Surely I would have known. So, boy, was I surprised when I looked at the chart. I definitely was prejudiced against attorneys. And everything that attorney told me was absolutely accurate. Now I had to ask a question she could not ask. How come she knows about it and I don't? Now, somebody spoke earlier about intelligence service or fear. Well, we physicians in an obsession gynecology know that nurses in lab and delivery and nurses and physicians talk. I mean, rumors go so fast. Professor Neve jokes about his head of Bailinson Hospital saying that Professor Niv doesn't want to know about any rumors, but he wants to know everything. Well, guess what? I went to the following department of obstetrics and gynecology. I thought, how is this possible? I'm not aware of it. Maybe I was on vacation. Maybe I was in Europe. Maybe I was in Israel. So I started calling physicians around in my department. Nobody heard about this thing. Well. The NSA, the Mossad, and the KGB can learn a lot from American hospitals. <laughs> and it so happens that an Israeli couple that I delivered, the, the wife obviously, uh, the husband worked, developed some kind of software that was bought out by EDS, Ross Perot, and the first site that he started was at Tazana Hospital. And he asked me, you know, Gil, what is the actual job description of patient improvement department? Well, I came up with all kinds of logical explanations. <laughs> the job description, listen carefully, of performance improvement department is control of circulation of information. And they are very effective. Now, what I did not know at that time, because I was still naive once upon a time, there is a protocol for naive people like myself if they do something which is considered totally absurd, suicidal, and that's to testify against the hospital where they're on staff. Or a major physician, so-called rainmaker, because the two fellows who actually did it, the physician and his associate, both Israelis, both double board certified, 
One of them trained with me a year after me at USC. So I had a very high esteem at the time about them. Well, turns out that what I thought was the most effective quality control system in the world, second to none, turns out to be the most effective, superb, and extremely well-crafted deception. I was myself, for 14 years, part of what I thought was the most effective quality control, second to none. The problem is that once I ask questions, the answers lead to more questions. And so I was then in another situation. I was that kid, very naive, call me stupid. The people that hear my story says, Gil, were you out of your mind? Well, in the story of Hans Christian Andersen, it focuses on the king that is marked by all the court around him and his experts that make him believe that he has the most beautiful clothes until a kid shows up and says, the emperor has no clothes. Guess who's the emperor? You, the patient. You, the healthcare system. This is the emperor. There is no single country in the world that has a quality and control system and safety procedures like the airline industry. Why? It's very simple. Follow the money. If a jumbo jet crashed every hour or two, would you fly? I don't. If we look at things very simply in Israel, since we are in Israel, more patients die in Israel from infectious disease caught in the hospital than from car accidents. Now, let's put that in proportion. Israel is a country at war since 1948, with many countries vouching to destroy it. But guess what? More Israelis die from car accidents when all wars together, including all terrorist acts. So I beg you to now realize that the biggest killer of all is the healthcare system. While the healthcare system is indeed performing in a superb, exceptional fashion with what we would characterize undoubtedly miracles. The most stupid things happen and for a reason. Let me give you a simple example in, Los in California. The legislator of California passed a law that every single department has to have X number of nurses per patient. Well, it all depends if it's an emergency situation, an ICU, medical, pediatric, surgical, ward. It's different. Now, how did it come up to my attention? The uh, pharmacist representing uh, Dr. Telad suggested to have some activists. Well, one of the biggest activist groups in California is the California Nurses Association. And they striked at Queen of Angels Hospital in Los Angeles. Why? Because they did not think they could perform the job with one nurse per 30 patients. Now, why not? Aren't those nurses highly qualified experts? Now, what is extraordinary, and I wrote it to, at that time, the governor, Schwarzenegger, all hospitals objected to the law that was passed by the legislature. So the only way to stop it is to have the government governor, who was Gray Davis before Schwarzenegger, either not sign it, so it's dead on arrival, or veto it. And both Gray Davis and Schwarzenegger basically did not sign it, so it was dead on arrival. 
until it came back a third time. Three times is a charm. But what was the argument of the hospitals? Governor, we will go bankrupt if we will have to have and pay all that overhead for all those nurses. But then I wrote to the governor, governor, the truth is not that. The income will be reduced. Why? Because as Professor Lucien Lee from Harvard described so well, in every industry, cars, computers, you have a warranty. If your car goes kaput uh, before 50,000 miles or five years or whatever the warranty, or if your computer is dead or whatever, within a year, you get a new one. No problems, no questions asked. And there's no guarantee in healthcare. There's no guarantee, by the way, from attorneys either. But the damage is a little different. As a consequence, Professor Lucien Leap says, perversely, there is an incentive and an economic benefit in a defective product. So the more complications, the more revenues. Hence, the economic interest of the CEO of a hospital is directly opposed to the best interest of a patient. Now, let me try to explain it to you as a CEO of a, of a hospital. Wouldn't you agree with me that the air in the hospital and the oxygen is far superior than the junk polluted air you get in the street? What's wrong with the patients spending a few days in the hospital? How about a few weeks in the hospital? You think it's funny? Well, it sounds funny the way I say it, but I'm going to give you a few examples where it's far from funny. And remember the picture of the king or the emperor that is naked. That's all of us. And there's no question, any one of us in this room one day, if we are not lucky, <laughs> we'll be a patient in a hospital. So I'd like to bring up to your attention something else. The word whistleblower really is not a nice word. When you use the word whistleblower, oh my God, you know, it's, it's a snitch. You know, it's not a nice person, you know. It reminds me, since I'm here in Israel, I can tell you the story. I grew up in Belgium, <coughs> and I was looking for a place, and I happened to see a grocery store on the corner, and there was an old lady there that was serving the people. I waited in line, and suddenly her grandkid comes. And she starts screaming at the grandkid. She says, you little bastard, you little no good. And she goes up and up and up to the worst possible insult. You are a Jew. Now, I never had such a situation. She didn't blame me for anything. So I point out to her, you know, he's not Jewish. You're right. So then she continued. <laughs> what am I trying to say? The word whistleblower has that connotation that is not particularly complimentary. Now, Goldman Sachs was curious to know what kind of persona becomes a whistleblower so that we maybe could detect those defects before they become too noisy. And so Erica Henrik contacted me and other whistleblowers she wanted to know what made me become a whistleblower. I said, Erica, do you think I woke up one morning and I said, wow, I'm going to be a whistleblower. That's not how it works. <laughs> as soon as the attorneys of that patient that both of the fallopian tubes were removed, informed the hospital and the insurance company of the physicians that they chose me as an expert, I received a very nice letter from the CEO of the hospital, who happens to be Jewish. Nice job. And he's writing to me, Gil, effective immediately, please call my office a half an hour before coming to the hospital. Call the head nurse at night, a half an hour before coming to the hospital, because you need to be escorted by security. Well, that's nice, he's worried about me. Obviously, I didn't get the memo. The memo was supposed to tell me, Gil, shut up or else. I didn't, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of guy that jeans, anybody who knows my family must know that we react very badly to threats. So I took it as a compliment that he was worried about me. <laughs> Obviously, I was not that stupid. But things got much worse. Very hostile. Life-threatening. Three days after I went to the FBI headquarters in Los Angeles, 17th floor, soundproof room. My office does not get a 
a letter, but my office gets a phone call from the same CEO of the hospital. He wants to talk to me right away, so my office pages me. So I call his office. He says, Dr. Malikovsky, effective immediately, and his voice was trembling, and clearly he was reading something. Somebody was, wrote it for him. Effective immediately, you no longer have any privileges in this hospital. So that's fine. See you in court. I had no patients at the hospital at the time. No single complaint from any patient for causes, negligence, cause of action. And the hospital violated every single law of California, U.S. and California Constitution by suspending my privileges for no good cause. And that's how a totally naive kid like myself turned out to be a foremost expert in the criminology of healthcare. That's not something they teach us in, health, in, in medical school. Now, anybody of you knows Reading? It looks like Switzerland, looks like Canada. That's the north part uh, of uh, California. Now, how many of you will agree with me that Reading is really an environment that appears to be very stressful? How many of you agree? Nobody. OK. Well, maybe you know something. So explain to me, how come Reading is a place where, per capita, Medicare has the highest number of patients operated from cardiovascular surgery? Is it somebody like uh, the Bakey or Cooley or Shamway that works there? No. It was known for quite a while, and in Modesto, California as well, Guess what? 83, 60% to 85% of patients were not supposed to be operated. It's good business if you operate patients that should not be operated. But nobody at that time could even imagine such a thing. How did it happen to learn about it? And that uh, uh, Dana spoke yesterday about the fact that even though she gave a course about how to better give disclosure, it raised from 35 to 50 percent. That means there's still 65 to 50 percent of people that are not disclosing. Well, here's what happened. Not one whistleblow, no two, three. A physician, Dr. Campbell, was fully aware of what was going on. Years before, it blew up. He went to the management and management did nothing. Why? Why kill the chicken which produces the golden eggs? The CEO of the hospital is paid a salary, a bonus, and also shares of the company called Tenet, a growing company that is doing terrifically and has actually, Reading has become the flagship of what every hospital of Tenet should do around the country. But that was not enough. Dr. Campbell was not able to turn around the situation. A American uh, priest, who used to be a croupier in Las Vegas, probably knew something, went to see this Dr. Moon. I'm not joking. That's his name, M-O-O-N, probably originally from Korea. And sure enough, Dr. Moon found out that this priest is about to die within three to six months. It's a miracle he came that day to see Dr. Moon. Because we have at Reading one of the finest cardiovascular surgeons. Now, since he did not feel too bad, he went over to a friend. He was in Las, came from Las Vegas. So he went over to friends in Las Vegas. He went a second opinion. And he shows all the tests that were done by Dr. Moon. And they said, there's nothing here. So there can't be. So we got a third opinion in San Francisco by a foremost cardiologist at UCSF, which is University of California, San Francisco, Zippo, nothing garnished. Since his friend in Las Vegas, his CPA, is familiar with US law that provides financial incentive for whistleblowers, whereby they get a certain percentage, 15% of whatever the government saves. And so Tenet ended up with the largest uh, sanction, monetary sanction by the Department of Justice, which was $62.5 million. Now, that's not enough. What happened then is that Tenet had to pay $30 million to the government for improper financial arrangements. 
12 million to the California state. And guess what? 395 million for 769 cardiac patients, half a million dollars to each patient. Doctors' insurance were reimbursed 32.5 million, and it ended up with $1.5 billion. So guess what happened with the shares of Tenet? The shares of Tenet were sky high, dumped all the way down. This was the second largest chain of private hospitals in the US. Briefly in Modesto, I uh, saw the Garden Grove, there was a very interesting situation. The uh, infection rates post-operatively at Garden Grove was very high, but no surgeon was aware of why. One, two people, actually three people knew, the CEO, the head nurse of surgery, and one other nurse in surgery. Anybody wants to guess what was the reason for the infections, uh, post-operative infection rate? Guess what? The sterilizator, sterilization equipment was not always working perfectly well. So there were two choices. Either you buy a new machine, or you just let it go. What's wrong with a little infection? You know. So you get a little IV, you know, patient stays a week or so. So clearly, the CEO had no interest in changing that machine. But here's what happened. It was exceptional, and that's why we know about it. Usually, chairman of departments are picked up and have a conflict of interest with the administration of the hospital. Dr. Rosen, who was chief of surgery, was also a professor at, uh, at Irvine, at the University of California, Irvine orthopedic surgeon. And he reported it like I did the same year in the year 2000 to the Joint Commission that everybody is so fearful of the Joint Commission. <coughs> but if the Joint Commission was so effective, why do we have that problem? Let me show you how it works. Very interesting. So obviously Dr. Rosen is shocked to see that the Joint Commission gave a grade of 93 out of 100 to Garden Grove Hospital. How is that possible? Well, guess what? Former chairman of the medical staff of Garden Grove, and I'm not joking, his name was um, a terrible name. I just I can't put the name on it. There's a movie about it, but anyhow, I'll get back to it. But a name that you cannot imagine a physician would have such a name. But he was also, not only after that, he was president of the California Medical Association, then president of the American Medical Association, and he was on the board of the Joint Commission. You don't see any conflict of interest here, do you? <laughs> now you understand how the system is so effective. I don't have time to talk about uh, the uh, Joint Commission, but I'll just briefly go before I see that my time is up. But here's what the former president of the Joint Commission says. I did not invent, I quote, I was so shocked, I ran over to get the tape. There is no financial incentive for CEOs to achieve higher quality of care as it would reduce revenues for hospitals. That comes from the top. 20% of physicians, well now here's something else we need to be aware. If you accuse a physician of something he or she did not do, you basically cut off all life support. Many physicians come from families of physicians, not like me. If you take off the license or just suspend it, that's so tragic that in Oregon, and they never repeated that study anywhere else, it was published in JAMA and it is not on the internet, so it's on our website at the Alliance for Patient Safety. 20% of those physicians committed. Now, I don't have time to elaborate on the code of silence, but let's uh, please see that what uh, Dana found and showed us yesterday is the same in the United States. It is the same worldwide. It's a phenomenon that is uh, widespread and has many, many causes. Can't go into the details, but I'd like to describe to you something very important. In the beginning, when in the States I spoke about the fact that we need to have a effective quality control, quality of care. The first reaction was, Gil, are you crazy? You want the Canadian system? So I started thinking about it. And then came the Rand Corporation study. And I met with the gentleman, and I thought the Rand Corporation was purely military. In fact, 50% is healthcare studies. And here's where they came up. Fascinating. In the United States, it makes no difference where the adult lives, why, where, and from whom they seek care, Whatever their race, gender, or financial status, they are equally at risk. Now, how is that possible? I thought that wealthy people get good care. Well, in Israel, it's about the same. 
Zichrono Levacha, Eli Hurwitz, that I knew personally, died within eight hours at Tel Hashomer from toxic shock syndrome. That was a disaster. So apparently, in the United States, we have three economic systems in the US healthcare. One, the capitalist system is fee, uh, pay for fee or per service. Now, here's the problem. If you have a very good insurance or you're very wealthy, you're going to be subjected to plenty of treatments if you have the money and you're going to be over-treated. Being over-treated, you're going to have problems. True, you have what we would call a socialist system, but it has a better name, you know, it's HMO. Sounds much better, HMO. Well, guess what? In an HMO system, you or the employer, Kaiser, who started it, out of goodwill for its own employees, Kaiser Aluminum, it was the largest company producing aluminum, if you pay a fixed amount, let's say $1,000 per employee per year to Kaiser, employee can go as many times as necessary, gesundheit, as we say in Yiddish. But economically speaking, it's in the best interest of the HMO, the patient never shows up. And so you have the problem of complications and errors for under-treatment. Then comes what I would call the communist system, but ooh, communist is not a good word in the United States, so it's called uh, what is the word they use? It's a very funny word, but anyhow, you've surely heard about it. That's basically when the government pays, or the county pays, or the state pays. And then, as uh, Professor Karen said, if you come, but that's true in the private system as well, if you come on July 1st, you have the student, but basically you're in a county system where basically nobody is fired, it's a political position. You're just lucky if somebody is very dedicated, and I trained in county hospitals. Those are the best places to train. I'm not sure it's the best place to be a patient. And I trained in the temple of Murphy's Laws, which is Cook County Hospital in Chicago. If anything can go wrong, you're guaranteed it will. Give you a simple example. WNL means within normal limits. In the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, when we got a referral from the Internal Medicine Department and they wrote pelvic exam, WNL, we translated it into, we never looked. So I will now speed up and simply bring up to your mind something which is in Israel not politically correct. But just look at the numbers. Health Grades is a publicly traded company that does a lot of studies. It was asked by Medicare, government agency, to review 37 million medical records, patients 65 years and older, over a period of three years. Very conservatively, they reached the conclusion that 600,000 patients died over three years from preventable medical errors. Now, 600,000 over 37 million is not much. <coughs> But if you multiply 600,000 by 10, we get to the magic number of 6 million. And that's when I called it the US healthcare holocaust. And it's only 1.6% of Medicare patients. But this is what happens. I'm not going to go and elaborate, but I will just leave you with two thoughts. One from Seneca the Younger, Roman, who says to err is human, that's true, but to repeat the error is of the devil. And that's why we cannot be too complacent, Professor Corrin, regarding being too magnanimous and forgiving. And what we have on our website is the following. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So I encourage all of you, the same way the associates of... Uh, Dr. Telad did. Now, I would like to explain to you why we have this painting of Magritte on our website, the Alliance for Patient Safety US, as well as the Alliance for Patient Safety Israel. The name of that painting is La Grande Famille, the big family. We are all on the same boat. We are all on the same plane, but it's not as safe as a plane. I thank you very, very, very much. I just want to bring up to Professor Corrin, you know, Something else, it's not just the economics, as I mentioned earlier, that causes airline industry to be safe, but the law as well. 
I will never forget, and it's on our website, captain of United Airlines, if I'm not mistaken, was really upset because the gear of his plane was effective. And he, he could have crashed the plane in San Francisco. When he discovered the reason, he just chewed up the mechanic. Guess what? Who was fired? The mechanic or the captain? The captain. You don't, you don't behave like that. You don't raise your voice. But then what happened next? The law is very clear on the subject. The captain sued United, and he won. Now, you try to do that as a physician. Welcome. Good luck. I prevailed against the largest chain of private hospitals in the world, HCA, before the Supreme Court of California. But that was based on the violation of due process. You cannot condemn a person before you judge them. It sounds so elementary. But it has happened many times before. It will happen again. But we have to broaden the spectrum of what we want to change. We must establish not only acknowledge what the problem, awareness, but also to have laws to protect physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers so that they will not be part of the code of silence. So that Ophir's dream will be realized. Thank you very, very much for your, intention, for your time and for inviting me.